The Where Our Minds Wanda podcast may contain sensitive content. Listener discretion is advised. Greetings, fellow wanderers, to the places our minds wander. The house at the end of the dirt road, where disembodied voices whisper and strange sounds make the living shiver. Where shadows lurk at the edge of the woods, just outside your back door. And mysterious lights speed beyond reason across the clear night sky. Odd events throughout time that lead you down the rabbit hole. I'm Wes. And I'm Beth. And this is where our minds wander. Hello and welcome to Where Our Minds Wander, all you fellow wanderers. Thank you for joining us. Yes, hello everybody. And to all you moms out there, we hope you had a happy Mother's Day. We had a good weekend. It wasn't just Mother's Day. It was also your birthday. That it was. And we pretty much celebrated it Friday night and Saturday night. Yeah, we did. And then we did Mother's Day Sunday. Yeah, we had a a lot of uh, celebrating going on. It was a good weekend. It was an awesome weekend. And you know what, Beth? I don't think that we're going to do any housekeeping this episode. All righty. So you want me just to get right into it? No. Oh. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> well, that was confusing. What would you like, Beth? And hit the brakes. Well, I would like to thank everybody for being new subscribers on our YouTube channel. Oh, yes, definitely. And also, we've had a a bunch of new Facebook followers. Yes, we appreciate that, too. And some new listeners. So we just want to say that we appreciate each and every one of you, and we hope you like what you hear and stick around. Yes, sticking around is important. (laughs) We hope they do that. Are you done? (laughs) Yes, can I get started? You're now? so giddy. I know. Well, it was a good weekend and I had cheesecake. So I still have a little bit of a sugar rush going on. Yeah, the cheesecake was pretty good. It was good. And I didn't have to bake it, so it was even better. All right. So would you like to tell all our fellow wanderers where your mind wandered for this episode? Yes. You sure? You're yes. not gonna keep uh, going on and on? No, I'm ready to go. All right. Okay. Across the United States, there are several former asylums that are considered incredibly haunted. Waverly Hills comes to mind, or Trans Allegheny. Rolling Hills in Bethany, New York, is also on the most haunted lists when you do a quick Google search, or Eloise in Michigan. But there's one in Indiana whose name might not be as well known but whose hauntings have made it a major hotspot for paranormal investigations for almost two decades. The Randolph County Infirmary and Asylum, just outside of Winchester, Indiana, has been known by many different names over the years, including the Randolph County Poorhouse, the Randolph County Poor Farm, and the Countryside Care Center. From its beginning in the mid-1800s to its closure in 2008, over 200 people died within its walls that we know of. Twenty-three known souls were buried on the property when their families either refused to claim them or there was no known family to contact. The oldest is Peter Brown, an enslaved man from West Virginia who made his way to the Union Army and worked as a waiter before traveling north and finding himself a resident, or an inmate, as they unfortunately called them, at the Randolph County Infirmary. He passed away in 1891. The most recent of the named grave sites is John Clearwater, who died in 1925. However, These 23 aren't the only people to have been buried on the property. There are an estimated 50 more graves on site, unmarked, and therefore completely unknown. Originally, the property was a privately owned farm. 
In the 1820s, the farmer and his wife welcomed down-on-their-luck people to live at the farm and work for their room and board. The couple received compensation from the state to do this. At one time, there were as many as 13 residents who were called inmates even then, but many of them were unable to do physical labor because they were either elderly or too sick. But then, sometime before 1851, the property was purchased by the county, and an official county poor asylum was built. This meant that orphaned children and adults who were either physically or mentally unable to support themselves were brought to the poorhouse, where they would work in exchange for food and shelter. In some cases, war widows found themselves in the poorhouse along with their very young children. The first building, which was completed in 1853, was a 65 by 40 foot wooden structure with two hallways and 16 rooms. It cost $1,750 to build, which would be a little under $4,900 in today's money. So, not a very expensive building. The original structure burnt down within the first year in January of 1854. But due to the overwhelming need, a second building was constructed almost immediately. According to the official Randolph County Infirmary website, a description of the infirmary in 1882 said that the 45 to 70 inmates required constant care and that at one point the building housed 78 inmates, with as many as 12 of them being homeless or orphaned children. Even as early as 1873, there were horrific accounts making it into the local papers about the ways inmates were suffering at the asylum infirmary. Like a Cambridge City Tribune article from August 21, 1873, about a Miss Mary J. Blair, a young woman who died while giving birth. She had written a note to a man named A. H. Green of West Liberty, Ohio, naming him as the father. He did later confess to being the father and said he had no idea where Mary had disappeared to. There was no mention of what became of the newborn child. Or Sam Preston, who was mentioned in the same Cambridge City Tribune article. Preston had tried to commit suicide by driving a penknife blade into his own head with a flat iron. Whether it was meant to be serious or to make light of the horrifying incident isn't clear, but the paper wrote, quote, The doctor pulled out the blade and Sam did not succeed in shuffling off. End quote. This second building was made of bricks fired on site at an improper temperature and was deemed unsafe and unsanitary in the 1890s, so it was torn down. A third building, which is the one that still stands today, was also made out of red brick. With its matching towers flanking both sides of a gray painted double door, it looks somewhat like a school. That is, until you realize just how far back the 50,000-square-foot building extends. It included six separate wards, a few private rooms, a laundry, kitchen, and separate dining rooms for men and women. It was completed in 1899. And interestingly, it actually included a lot of the original building materials from the first unsafe brick building. Outside, within the 350-acre property, there was a pump house, livestock barn, hay barn, a machine shed, a chicken house, and later, two garages. The cemetery sat 230 yards northwest of the main building. As you would expect, the Randolph County Infirmary followed the same narrative as most poor houses of the time. It welcomed orphans, the physically ill and the mentally ill, 
and it became overcrowded very quickly. When tuberculosis made its way into the building, it spread like wildfire, and there were several TB-related deaths. But there were also several suicides and a handful of murders, like the resident who was pushed out of a second-story window. Some have estimated the total deaths to be around 200, but there's no official record, so it's impossible to say. Some of the deaths were noted in the papers, like the Union City Times. One notice published on January 17, 1908, said, quote, Moses DeVore died at the infirmary near Winchester two weeks ago, buried in Potter's Field, end quote. Moses received a marked gravestone. But others didn't. Like 10-year-old Orlando Hyatt, who passed away at the infirmary in 1924, or brothers Thomas and James Gray, who died within weeks of each other. Thomas was 68. The Tipton Daily Tribune noted in September of 1941 that inmate Philip G. Fraze was struck and killed by an automobile at the infirmary as he was walking behind a team of horses. But the strangest and possibly most disturbing unmarked burial at the infirmary has to be that of Mose the Mummy. The homeless man, simply known as Mose, was found murdered in a barn in Lima, Indiana. Now, Lima is about 134 miles from Winchester. Since no family claimed the body, he was bought by a carnival and spent several years on the western Ohio and eastern Indiana Carnival and County Fair circuit as an exhibit. Now, I tried to find out more information about him as far as who bought him or where he was put on display, but I found absolutely nothing. But after his mummy was deemed in too bad a shape to be on display anymore, he was buried at the Randolph County Infirmary in an unmarked grave. So, the cemetery itself is kind of a sad place with just 23 marked graves and over 50 that are still unmarked. Of those who have gravestones, some have names and dates, like Peter Brown's, and some just have names. Most of the dated stones are from between 1905 and 1918. Several of these people spent at least a decade living at the infirmary. But of the 50 that are unmarked, well, some of their stories are incredibly sad, like that of Mary J. Blair or 10-year-old Orlando Hyatt. But it's not like anyone hasn't tried to give them their names back. As early as 1938, descendants of former residents, like John Neff, tried to get a fence erected around the cemetery to at least mark where it was. And in 1985, the Historical Society reset as many headstones as they could find. To this day, a group of people are still trying to match what little documentation there is to the possible grave sites. And there are a few residents that we do know quite a bit about, especially those who resided there into the 21st century, like Doris. Doris M. Addington came to the infirmary at the age of 11 in 1926. According to the Randolph County website, her mother had died, and she and her five siblings were separated. The younger ones went to orphanages to be adopted, but Doris was considered beyond adoptable age, so she was sent to the infirmary. She was later joined there by her father, who died of a heart attack right in front of her. Over her many decades there, she suffered a mental breakdown and eventually went blind. Despite all this, Doris was described as always cheerful 
and that she liked to talk with everyone. She spent many years in the infirmary's kitchen, where she cooked daily meals for the other residents. She passed away in 2006 at the age of 91. In 1994, the Randolph County Infirmary was renamed the Countryside Care Center, and there were 12 residents, and thankfully they were no longer referred to as inmates anymore. And when the building closed for good in 2009, there were just five residents who had to be relocated. The building then became a county storage facility before being purchased by private owners in 2015. Seeing the potential for paranormal investigation, the owners found themselves booking over 60 film crews within the very first year. Because, as I mentioned, the Randolph County Infirmary and Asylum is considered by many to be on the list of most haunted places. There are several unexplained things people experience while investigating the former infirmary, like the sound of doors slamming at odd times when no one else is in the building. According to the hauntedus.com website, the most common area to hear these slamming doors is in the former holding cell area. The holding cell area was where unruly inmates were held until staff believed they had calmed down enough to be let out. Investigators to the infirmary have often reported that they left all the doors open, heard the slamming sound, and then discovered that at least one of the doors was now closed. Not able to find any open windows or causes of a draft, they couldn't really explain how the door could have slammed shut. There is often the sound of children running by and childlike giggling. And it's also common to hear children's voices as if they are playing with each other or hoping to play with living visitors. Although the disembodied children's voices are heard all throughout the building, the laughter or giggling is most frequently heard on the first floor in the women's wing. Adult footsteps, from shuffling to fast-paced walking, are commonly reported throughout the entire building. Usually heard in the empty hallways, Many investigators describe the walking as sounding more like someone pacing rather than moving from one point to another. But then there's also reports of lone screams filling the air. These disembodied screams, most often female, seem to echo down the corridors. Loud, unexplained crashing sounds have come from both the kitchen and the basement, with no visible explanation. And objects have been known to move for no reason. Specifically, there's a tricycle in the attic that people swear has moved several feet by itself. When they leave, it's in one spot, but when they come back, it's across the room. Or the many dolls that people have left in Doris's former room. Some of them have also been found in completely different spots than they were left in. And speaking of Doris, she, allegedly, is one of the most active ghosts at the infirmary. People have caught EVPs and disembodied voices attributed to Doris in both her former room and in the kitchen. Along with the dolls that appear to move without being touched, Items in the kitchen also move, especially if someone living moves things out of place. When they leave and come back, the moved item is right back where Doris wanted it. But there's a darker spirit at the infirmary, simply known as the judge. Allegedly, there was a former judge employed at the infirmary who would hold mock trials up in the attic, doling out harsh punishments to the residents who broke his rules. 
Today, his gruff and authoritative voice has been caught on voice recorders, and many paranormal investigators feel that he tries to silence the many children's spirits who try to reach out to be heard. In fact, the attic was the largest open space in the building, and the children who lived at the infirmary would play up there. Many people believe that the tricycle that's kept up there moves because the children move it. It's not clear why the judge would want to silence children, but it could be that he's still holding mock trials in the afterlife. It would be hard to second-guess the people who say that the Randolph County Infirmary is haunted because of the 50 souls who are buried beside it in unmarked graves. But not all of the hauntings seem to correspond with this. Certainly not Doris, who, as far as I could tell, was buried at the Woodlawn Cemetery in Maxville, Indiana. But this was kind of interesting because I looked for her gravesite on Find a Grave, and it said that her mother died in 1946, which would have put Doris in her 30s. So that doesn't line up at all with the narrative that people tell about Doris's life, because the kind of popular narrative is that she came to the infirmary when she was 11. So there's a bunch of possibilities there. Um, I mean, it could just simply be that the Find a Grave website is incorrect, like the information on her page. Or it could be that I actually found the wrong Doris M. Addington, although the place and dates were correct for it to be her. But there's also the third possibility that the narrative being told about Doris is slightly wrong. That possibility could be why Doris's spirit is still said to linger at the infirmary, or it could simply be that the Randolph County Infirmary was the only home she knew for 59 years. You know what I find sad is that all these asylums, well, they started off with great intentions. Yes, they did. And then they just got inundated with too many people coming in. Yeah, they were all overwhelmed, yes. understandably overwhelmed and understaffed with um, underqualified people who I think wanted the best, like you said, had good intentions, but they just didn't know how to care for people. Right. And with you got to figure these doctors and nurses, I mean, you can only go f for so long when you just know you're not really getting the help you need and they're bringing more and more people than what you have for space. It, it had to be awful to watch these people suffer. Yeah. And unfortunately, it was the residents that you know, suffered for it. Well, some of the, some of the doctors and nurses did too, because well, that's there's a few of them that did commit suicide. That's true. We have heard that at other asylums. You're right. Well, we'll be back right after this short break. Hey, did you know? In 1924, the American people were more than happy to do their part to help listen for Martians. Encouraged by Mars' relatively close orbit to Earth, the U.S. government asked everyone in the U.S. to turn their radios off for the first five minutes of every hour on Radio Silence Day. Even military outposts obliged, turning their radios off too. This way, astronomers could listen intently while hoping to hear radio signals coming from the Martians on the Red Planet. They didn't hear anything. Who'd have thunk it? All right, we're back. Yes, we are. Are you ready to get into your story? Yeah, that I am. <laughs> well, go for it then. It's a great one. It is. It, I, I know what you're going to talk about. I have a hard time with it, but I'll, I'll listen. <laughs> yeah, and I totally understand how you feel. Because normally this would be a joyous time for 
people of all ages, but not on this day. But I think it's important. And it did happen and it brought about change. So that's right. It did. Yeah. And these people's stories need to be told. Yes, I agree. In the summer of 1944, the people of Hartford, Connecticut, like the rest of the country, were constantly thinking about war. For many, their fathers, uncles, brothers, husbands, and boyfriends were fighting in combat far from home. So when the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus came to town in July, thousands of people flocked to the field on Barbour Street looking for some laughter and much-needed distraction. Promised as the greatest show on earth, somewhere between 6,000 and 8,000 circus goers arrived on July 6, 1944, despite the relentless humid summer heat. Hoping to see the lions, the elephants, the sequined tightrope walkers, and the fire eaters, thousands of children entered the Grand Big Top with their families. But some children, like famous child actor Charles Nelson Riley, had come with just a friend. Although Riley later went on to star in television shows like The Match Game, The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, The Dean Martin Show, Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In, and The Love Boat, in 1944, he was just 13 years old. But wanting to attend the circus so badly, he had snuck out of his house against his mother's orders and had arrived at the circus with a friend, just as giddy and excited as thousands of others. The Big Top truly lived up to its name. It was 450 feet long, 200 feet wide, and stood 48 feet high. It could seat up to 9,000 people. Inside, it was truly a three-ring circus with three separate ring areas for performers, two stages, and a 25-foot wide track separating the performance areas from the spectators. The spectators had a choice between bleacher seats and individual folding chairs. Besides the main entrance, there were eight smaller ones so spectators were free to come and go as they pleased, stocking up on popcorn and cotton candy as the show went on, one colorful and enthralling performance after another. Everything was running so smoothly that it was doubtful that most people knew that the circus was suffering from worker shortages. Shortages at the time were to be expected, because most of the men were off in Europe fighting a war. They also probably didn't realize that the Big Top had been erected quickly, right on top of freshly mowed grass and dirt. The dirt had been covered over in hay and wood shavings to make it more comfortable and less dusty in the almost intolerable humid wind. As the performances continued wowing the massive audience with such a spectacle of color and energy, the crowd fell silent as French lion tamer Alfred Cook took to the center ring, according to ConnecticutHistory.org. As Quartz Lions both scared and amazed the audience, the famous trapeze performers, the Flying Walendas, got into position. Later known for balancing seven chairs on the tightrope simultaneously, the Flying Walendas often performed without a net. The audience rightfully anticipated a tremendous act. But then, from somewhere inside the big top, a female employee shouted alarming words. The tent was on fire. Almost immediately, the big top band leader, Merle Evans, instructed the musicians to play Stars and Stripes Forever, the circus's code signal for something is very wrong. Although it was standard practice at the time, what none of the spectators realized was that the big top had been waterproofed. The canvas had been coated in a mixture of 1,800 pounds of paraffin wax and 6,000 gallons of gasoline. What initially was a small grass fire, started by a tossed cigarette near the southwest wall, the flames spread almost immediately to the highly flammable big top. The power shorted out. Ringleader Fred Bradna yelled over and over for everyone not to panic and to make their way to the exits in an orderly fashion. But due to the power shortage, barely anyone heard him. 
the lions were quickly herded up to the animal chutes, to awaiting cage wagons and pulled to safety. The audience of thousands reacted in all kinds of ways, some believing that the fire would most certainly be put out quickly while well, they stayed in their seats. Others searched for their family members before even trying to exit. And then there were those who made it safely out, but then unable to find their family members, and they re-entered the tent. Ringleader Bradna and the ushers continued to guide thousands of people to the exits, but many were blocked by animal cages, and at least two were blocked by animal chutes, forcing the now panicking spectators to bottleneck to the few cleared exits. Other ushers hauled bucket after bucket of water to the tent, trying to douse the flames. Some tore down the engulfed sections with their bare hands, trying to make clear passages for the people still trapped inside. Within minutes, the flames had reached 100 feet. The paraffin wax began falling in scalding puddles onto the terrified people trying to escape, burning them badly. Some, in complete desperation, began slicing holes into the burning canvas with their pocket knives until they could squeeze through. It took just eight minutes for the 19-ton flaming big top to collapse on the hundreds of souls still caught inside. Over 700 people were badly injured from either burns or broken limbs. According to guildfordfire.com, the true death toll is immeasurable. First, there were hundreds of free tickets given out earlier that day to people all over the city of Hartford, so the number of spectators to begin with isn't confirmed. Secondly, most of the estimates had to be based on individual body parts that were recovered and some were so small that no positive ID could be made. Thirdly, there is no telling how many people were never reported missing. Some estimates say 168 people died, with the majority of them being children. But based on the number of people who left shell-shocked and didn't seek out immediate medical attention, others say both the number of injuries and the death toll were considerably higher. It was a horrible, devastating tragedy. Newspapers all over the country ran the story, and outrage was rightfully high. As victims' families mourned, people all over the nation mourned with them. People wanted someone to blame, and they demanded new safety measures. But before either of those two things could happen, they were hit with a more horrifying question. Who was Little Miss 1565? Only about six years old, Little Miss 1565 was wearing a white dress and her hair was blonde. Hartford Police Sergeants Thomas Barber and Edward Lowe took several photographs of her, with her face angled to the right, so that the newspaper readers wouldn't be distressed by the burns on the left side of her beautiful face. At first, the search for Little Miss's parents was local, but as the days stretched on and no one had come to claim her, their search widened. Soon, Little Miss's photo was run in national magazines all over the country, all asking the same question. Did anyone know this little girl? And could someone, anyone, identify her? As the weeks passed on, the officers took both her fingerprints and footprints. They also took dental records, and still, no one came to claim her. Not knowing what to do, but more than certain that she deserved a proper burial, the officers made sure she was interred at Hartford's Northwood Cemetery. For the rest of their lives, both officers placed flowers on her grave every year on Christmas, Memorial Day, and July 4th. They also never stopped searching for her family. She remained at Northwood as simply Little Miss 1565 for 47 years. After Sergeant Lowe's death, his widow came forward in 1981 and said that her husband had found Little Miss's family. Distraught, they had begged for no publicity. However, Miss Lowe could not provide a name. 
1987, an anonymous note was found at her gravesite that read, Sarah Graham is her name, 7-6-38, date of birth, 6 years twin. Investigators did look into the claim and determined that no one by the last name Graham had ever been reported by a family member missing. Nor were there any children born with a surname Graham in the right time frame in Hartford, Connecticut. Suggestions that Sarah Graham was actually from Massachusetts have never been substantiated or disproved. But then in 1991, another name was suggested by authors Rick Davey and Don Massey, Eleanor Emily Cook. Eleanor, her brother, and her mother had been at the circus that day. The mother, Mildred Cook, had been badly burned in the accident and was told once she had been taken to the hospital that both her children had died in the fire. Davy and Massey theorized in their book, A Matter of Degree, The Hartford Circus Fire and Mystery of Little Miss 1565, that investigators were so overwhelmed by the magnitude and state of the victim's remains in 1944 that the Cook family was given the wrong remains of their eight-year-old daughter, Eleanor. In 1955, Eleanor's brother Donald came forward and said that he thought that this was true. However, prior to the book's publication, Mildred Cook insisted that the photo of Little Miss did not look like her Eleanor. In addition, Eleanor's aunt and uncle insisted that the photograph of Little Miss 1565 looked nothing like their darker-haired niece. Despite the Connecticut State Police Forensics Unit conducting hair sample analysis and stating that it was not a match, it was declared in 91 that Little Miss had been identified as Eleanor Emily Cook. Her body was exhumed and placed next to that of her brother Edward who had perished with her. Author Stort Onan, in his 2001 book, The Circus Fire, A True Story of American Tragedy, said that the heights of the two girls did not match, nor did their facial shape, or, like her relatives had said, their hair color. In addition, their dental records didn't match either. Onan believes that there was a mix-up with the remains as well. He thinks another family was mistakenly given Eleanor's remains and they mistakenly buried her as their child. Most recent researchers and investigators have proposed that Eleanor's remains were one of five that were never claimed, three of which were adults, and the fourth being Little Miss 1565. So, although Little Miss 1565 has a gravestone with a name on it, Eleanor Cook, it may not be who she really was. As the search went on for Eleanor's family, the public demanded punishment for the devastating tragedy. Although no one was ever charged with starting the fire, which was deemed an accident, five Ringling Brothers employees were charged with manslaughter. First, according to ConnecticutHistory.org, there was a lack of fire extinguishers. Second, the exits had been blocked. Third, the circus fire trucks on scene were actually parked over a quarter of a mile away. Four of the five employees pleaded no contest and were sentenced to prison. However, they were pardoned a year later. Meanwhile, Ringling Brothers paid $4 million to the victims' families. However, six years later in 1950, Ohio police arrested a former Ringling Brothers Circus employee named Robert Dale Sagi for arson. Having set several fires in the city of Circleville, Sagi also admitted to setting fires in Portland, Maine, Providence, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire. He also admitted to committing four unrelated murders. As it turns out, Sagi claimed to have been at the Hartford Circus in 1944. Saying that a Native American riding a flaming horse told him to start fires beginning when he was 16 years old, Sagi claimed that he had started the Hartford fire on purpose. 
He was committed to a psychiatric hospital for paranoid schizophrenia. Although authorities were able to prove that Segui had started several fires, they were unable to put him in Hartford in July of 1944. So, Although he was charged with arson and murder for his other crimes and received a 44-year sentence, he was never formally charged with the Hartford Circus Fire. In his later years, from about 1991 to 1994, Sagi recanted his story, saying he hadn't been responsible for the fire in Hartford. So here we have one of the worst disasters in Connecticut history, with two unsolved pieces, how exactly the fire started, and the identity of Little Miss 1565. Unfortunately, it often takes a tragedy for things to change, and one of the spectators in Hartford that day, who I hadn't mentioned, just happened to be Connecticut State Police Commissioner and State Fire Marshal Edward J. Hickey. Immediately after the tragedy, the state of Connecticut signed new laws regulating fire safety for all public performances. As a survivor, Hickey recalled the absolute horror of the day in subsequent interviews. As you can imagine, many survivors were hesitant to tell their stories. For actor Charles Nelson Riley, the experience haunted him for the rest of his life. He said in interviews that he could never really deal with theaters after that because when the lights went down, he'd be instantly transported back to that day. The experience haunted Maureen Krekian as well. Krekian, who was 11 years old in 1944, was supposed to go to the circus with neighbors. But when she arrived at their house, they had already left. Since the circus was right on her road, she decided to walk there alone and try to meet up with him. When she couldn't find them, she went into the big top and sat about a third of the way up the bleachers by herself. She said she recalled someone yelling, and then there was a huge ball of fire near the very top of the tent. All around her, people panicked and rushed for the nearest exit, which was blocked by animal cages. She could see a man lifting child after child and flinging them over the cages to the other side, trying to save them. Krekian decided to jump from the bleachers instead, and she was lucky because she landed just right in the hay. And even luckier, there was a young kid there with a pocket knife, slashing a hole through the canvas side. Krekian said that she grabbed a little girl standing next to her and pulled them both through the opening. Seven-year-old survivor Judith Shapiro was too scared to jump from the bleachers. She stood paralyzed in fear until someone literally pushed her off. When she fell, she landed on a folding chair. Luckily, she survived her injuries. So why did I choose to tell you about this catastrophic moment in history? Well, that's because, like the Boston Molasses Flood and the sinking of the Titanic, it really happened. And I think we should all know why ships are required to have lifeboats and why public venues should have strict fire codes. There's a reason why we have safety codes. And I think it's really important to do what we can to honor and remember the people who suffered great losses before these laws ever existed. It is a little morbid, but I think you had a good reason. I mean, unfortunately, that is why a lot of laws, regulations are put into place because something terrible happens. Right, because people either cut corners... To save money. Cover if, canvas tents with gasoline and paraffin wax. Right. And think that's a good idea. Yes. Yeah. With straw down on the floor. Yes. And knowing that people are smoking. Right. Uh, it's just, it's crazy. Right. But we know people don't always think. You know, I've seen people at gas stations filling up their car, cigarette in hand. Right. And I mean, they were doing it to waterproof the tent. Right. So, I mean, they had an, you know, an intent behind it. But how, of course, they knew it was flammable. I mean, that's just, the laws needed to be 
changed or right. or created to begin with. Right. And as we very well know, it always takes some kind of tragedy for things to get changed. Right. So it's sad. It's really sad. But something good came out of it. Yeah. And hopefully, I mean, I don't know how or when they would find Little Miss 1565's identity, but... Well, you they're still always, working on it. Yeah, there you, are researchers out there trying to figure it out still. Yes. So that's a good thing. It is. But I do think that Segi had something to do with it, although the police couldn't put him at the scene of the crime at that time. Right. Well, if he set all these other fires and then claimed that he did do it. Right. But then, you know, he was... Uh, diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. So then how reliable were his statements anyway? And then after he was on, I would assume after he was on medication is when he recanted the story, but... More than likely. I don't know. I mean, there had to be a lot of hate for him. Right. You know? Yeah. Well. Well, there is a lot more inf information out there for sure. So... Uh, like we always say, if you would like to know more, you can check our sources in our show notes. And uh, there's a lot more on his trial and, uh, you know, what he was accused of and more about the employees that were accused. So there's plenty more to read if you're interested. That there is. And I highly recommend delving into it. Yeah. Although it's a little, you know hard to take it's a little rough that it is there is some good information out there yeah that we couldn't put all into this segment well with that said i think that about wraps it up here i think so join us next week for all new episode of where our minds wander see you soon